Good morning, everyone. Welcome to The Chosen Life. I'm your host, The Chosen Lawyer. Talking today from uh, balmy plus five degrees Celsius weather in Toronto, Canada. And today's guest is living the chosen life in sunny Arizona. Pitching great coach, great guy, Steve Carsey. Steve, welcome to The Chosen Life. Well, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. And, uh, you know, looking forward to talking to you on The Chosen Life. So uh, I, I fell into a danger early on when I started the podcast where I would uh, talk for a bit with the person. And before we started the, uh, the show and I said, you know what, we got to just jump right into the show so everybody can get the natural flow because uh, stuff we'd be talking about. We want everybody to hear it anyways. So you and I just literally spoke for 30 seconds. But the funny, ironic part is that we've known each other for a lot of years, yet this is the first time we're actually meeting face to face. Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, you know, we've we've been talking for for a long time. Uh, the one interview you did with me a few years back when uh, I got into coaching, and then uh, you know just kept in touch and and you know just have a good rapport with each other. And and you know we talked a little bit about uh, doing a book together and uh, you know a lot of things. So uh, it's really good to see you. It's really good to you know meet you for the first time face to face on on Zoom. Uh, I guess that's the way of the world now. Uh, uh, partly but uh you know it's 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 been a it's been a ride and uh you know i'm just uh extremely uh fortunate to to be able to talk to you on the chosen life right now and and maybe get my story out a little bit and let people know uh, a little bit about me Uh, you know i i did send you an email i pitched you something that we're going to talk about still i still think that idea is really good it's just an evolution of how ideas work but uh, i know you're a real busy guy as well so we're going to talk about that the, um, the ironic part of it is you Google Steve Carsey interview. The number one hit is still MLB reports from 2011. So part of the interesting thing for people, when you're watching an episode like this, maybe the first time on The Chosen Life, this is why you hit subscribe. This is why you like the episode. And this is why you send comments. Because if you want to speak to Car- Steve Carsey, you ain't doing it through social media. You ain't reading any interviews because this man... Uh, you can't find him, you know, he's there, but he ain't. So uh, it's interesting, Steve, in this day and age, you know, since 2011, imagine we are still the number one interview together. How did you manage to keep it so private? You know, I guess I'm just a little bit old school. Uh, you know, 30 years ago, growing up um, as kids, we, we just didn't have any electronics, right? Um, we, we didn't have an iPad. We didn't have an iPhone. You know, we had to go outside and play in the neighborhood. We had to play whatever sport was being played at that particular time, whether it was football in the wintertime, hockey in the wintertime, you know, basketball in the fall or baseball in the spring and summer. That's what we did in the neighborhood. So, uh, you know, I I feel like I have to keep up with the new age and what is going on and things like that. But, uh, you know, social media is just not for me. It's just one of those things that it takes up too much time. I have enough during the day to do uh, than to sit on my phone or sit on my computer and, you know, either tweet or be on Instagram or Facebook or, or any one of those things. Uh, you know, I'll let that be to the new generation. I'll still know what it's about uh, and, and how to use it and, you know, where to get information and do things like that. But uh you know, uh, to, to kind of step back and stay quiet and, and be a little private. That's just kind of how I prefer it. I, I hear you. You know, we have all evolved in our careers, our professions, our lives, and how things have gone, how the internet, how computers have changed everything. You know, I remember as a young lawyer coming through the ranks, and it was around 2002, and I had the uh, BlackBerry pager. Okay, so this is before iPhones. So, and there's not even a cell phone version. There's a pager version, okay? And that's what we used to have. I remember being like 16 years old and I worked at the supermarket and to get connected, they had to page me and I had to go on a, on a, on a uh, I had to drop the quarter into the pay phone, remember pay phones, and there was no cell phones, right? And uh, now, you know, I find it liberating. My, so when, when, I, when I came up with the ranks, I remember the first time a law firm told me, we really like your emails to be able to go to your phone, please. I'm like, uh, I'm at the office enough. I have a home computer. Do I really need to have this? And they said, yes, you do. You need to be connected. I, and that was around 2002. 
I knew I was screwed at that time. I knew that means they're never going to be able to, I, I'm, I'm going to be connected 24 seven. The privacy is over. So I feel, I feel your pain in that sense and how liberating it is to kind of be off social media. At one point I made the decision I'm handing off to my marketing manager for, for law. You guys take care of it. I have to be on a presence so people can find me, forward me the messages when people are sending them in, but otherwise not being involved in the day-to-day -day drama and everything else and just living my life is fantastic. So I feel you in that respect. Yeah, it's great. Uh, it really is. Uh, you know, I get, I get to do what I need to do. Uh, you know, and it's funny you bring up a payphone. Uh, that's what I grew up with was, as well, where you had a bunch of quarters in your pocket. And if, if you needed to get a hold of somebody, you, you had to remember their phone number. Uh, it wasn't programmed in a, a cell phone for you. It wasn't programmed. And, you know, I talked to my son about that. And the first time I talked to him about a payphone, he couldn't even believe that there was such a thing that you had to have a quarter to put in a phone to call somebody because of, of what we have today. And it's a beautiful thing of what we have today. Um, you know, sometimes you don't want to get a hold of and it's, it's, it kind of a, is a deterrent, but uh, you know, in, 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 in what we're, you know, forced to deal with in, in these days and times uh, you know, it's always nice to, to get a hold of your loved ones if you need to be. This is where, you know, you, I think I caught lighting in the bottle because there's one glimpse of time when you were on Twitter that's when I found you from MLB reports. That's when we connected. I told you about my connection from Toronto and, you know, we talked about the trade with, with Ricky Henderson and yes. your Toronto connection. And you still, you were telling me uh, before we were speaking on the phone about you have a friend up in Newmarket here. So, you know, Ontario quite well. Uh, do you still make it down to Toronto ever? You know, I don't get there as, as often uh, as, as I would want, uh, you know, uh, like I told you, a good friend of mine, uh, he has a, he has a home here in, in the Scottsdale area. So he, him and his family come down here and I get to see him a lot, uh, you know, but again, with, with the pandemic and, and with what is going on and how, how you have to travel back and forth across the border, uh, it's, it's, it's really hard to get up there to see him. Uh, you know, me and my family would love to go up and, and visit in, in the summertime because it's such a beautiful area, uh, with all the, with all the lakes and, and whatnot. But, uh, at the end of the day, um, you know, with what what has happened with the pandemic, we, we just didn't get up there nearly nearly enough. Well, we'll touch upon uh, as far as career wise, where things went with you and uh, your direction, your future. I will tell you that when we live here in Canada and, you know, right now it's uh, it's raining like crazy. And before you know it, at night, it's going to freeze over it's gonna, and the driveway is going to be a skating rink. So for our vision our dream of spring and our dream of uh, the, the chosen life is heading either to Florida or heading to Arizona. So you chose the Arizona route. A lot of us, it's an easy drive to Florida. Like I'm going to be in Miami beach in a couple of weeks. So I'm just going to get some sun. Finally, I'm very excited about it, but I've never been to Arizona. I've always dreamt of it. It looks so beautiful on everything I've seen on TV. And uh, hopefully uh, I will make it there one day. And if we will uh, steak dinners, man. Yeah, absolutely. And if you make it here, I promise you probably will never go back. That's the, that's the danger. You know, that's what I, 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 you know, when I went, I went to Panama three times. I don't know if you've ever been to Panama, but like, wow. You know, when you see certain countries and you just gel with it, it's really hard to leave. Yeah, no doubt about it. Absolutely. So the people said, look, you got Steve Carsey. We can't find him. You found him. He's a great guy. When you hear Steve Carsey, you're obviously going to talk pitching, you know, you eat, breathe, sleep pitching. So let's give the people what they want. Let's jump in into topic number one. Uh, starters versus relievers and how the evolution of the game has come around. The example I always bring up is my fascination with the world baseball classic. And before, you know, um, Tampa Bay came up with it and, uh, the rest of baseball jumped on the whole opener idea. You know, I saw them doing in Cuba where they bring a closer at the beginning of the game, you know, throw some gas, then, th then bring in Lazo for a few innings and then bring in the next closer to the end of the game. How do you feel, and, and now we have the, you know, the seventh inning specialists, eighth inning specialists, you know, pitch counts, you know, people don't pitch past five innings. Where do you see the evolution as far as roles, pitching and baseball? Do you love it? Do you hate it? Good question. Uh, try, man. Love, love it. <laughs> loving it and hating it is, is, is a, a longer version of it. I mean, I think that's kind of the way the game has, has transformed and, evolutionized uh you know tampa bay as you just brought up had 
been in the forefront of that and and had started that and started with the opener. Uh, other teams have, have caught on, but uh, I don't think there's roles anymore uh, in the game. Uh, I think it's you put your best pitcher in the best spot that you feel uh, and analytics have, have taken over. Uh, you know, the front offices are, are getting on their computers. They're digging into the numbers and they're trying to figure out the best way, whether it be, uh, you know, pitch count, whether it be shifts, uh, which they're getting ready to take care of here after this new bargaining agreement, uh, you know, putting four guys in the outfield. So, uh, you know, it's, again, something that, you you have to grow with it's something that you have to understand as far as analytics go but i always think there's a balance between the two i, I really do i think the you know experience matters uh, especially in big moments and big situations in the game uh you you want your best guys uh with with your best stuff but you also want experience you just don't want to put some young guy out there uh because there's there's three things in in my opinion that uh, a computer can't tell you um, it's a guy's baseball IQ. Uh, I don't think you can put that into an algorithm, uh, a guy's ticker, which is his heart, uh, and how fast that beats when the pressure is high and 50,000 people are screaming, uh, and then the stones between your legs. And when you're standing out there and you have 50,000 people and it's the ninth inning, yeah. And it's the ninth inning. Uh, and you know, you got Mike Trout standing in the box with the bases loaded. How are you going to react to that situation? And, and a computer can't tell you that. Uh, you know, your, your eyes, your ears, your experience, being around the player or the guy uh, will, will let you know and determine if a guy can pitch in that situation. But uh, just to get back to the original question, you know, uh, I'm not a huge fan, but I understand where it goes uh, with, with, uh, with the opener and the roles and, and things like that. I mean, it's really taken away from the starting pitcher market. Uh, guys are not going deep into games anymore. Guys are capped at 100 pitches. Um, you know, it's more about how many guys you strike out than making contact and, and getting deeper in the game. If a guy throws 100 pitches in five innings, teams are, are fine with that because we have so many bullpen guys and the way they can manipulate the rosters uh, with bringing guys up and down, um, it's – it, it's a roster of really, instead of 26 players uh, 30 years ago or 25 players 30 years ago, um, it's a roster of maybe 32 or 33 players. And you got to create depth because you're always sending guys to the minor leagues and bringing up a fresh arm. So uh, I, I think there's a lot that goes into uh, an opener, uh, the shifts, the bullpen, the pitch count. Um, but that's the way. A lot of these front offices have transformed and, and taken the game. Uh, extremely smart guys uh, who, who feed the information. But, uh, you know, I always, I always think there's a balance. And the coaches who can have a balance between the analytics and their gut, I think, succeed very well. So on that note, you know, my, I love that line in Moneyball where they said, you know, I'm not here to sell jeans. I'm here to win ball games. you know? And, uh, you know, that's the viewpoint from a team perspective, I would say, you know, uh, I don't necessarily care what the shape size of the person is, uh, their age always, you know, it's can, do they, like I said, do they have the heart, can they win the games? But from a young player's perspective, you know, it's, it's not just, there's, to me, there's two groups of young players. There's the ones that are saying, I just want to win. I, I, that's all I care about. I don't care about my, my personal glory. Let's just go. And that's the good team player, the grinder, you know, those are the ones to me to become the coaches in the future. Then there's the ones that are sitting with their agents and they're like, okay, so if I'm playing this game in this role, how are my stats going to look up in arbitration? And when I become a free agent and they start doing that math and like, I don't really like this role because it's not conducive to my future career and earnings, you know, it becomes a whole, and then the, and then the agent calls up the, the front office and you start playing that game. When you have, you, you've been through the coaching ranks. So I know you would understand in the minors, did you have guys that would come up to you confidentially and say, listen, this is not really good for my future. I don't really like where they're placing me. I get it's good for the team, but it's not good for me. You know, did you have that? And how do you find that balance? There's always a balance. It's about developing relationships like anything else. It's about communication. It's about just understanding the guy and, and trying to have uh, a human to human uh, conversation with him about, hey, listen, I understand that you might not like this, but 
you don't get to pick and choose where you get to pitch in a game. Uh, you know, that's up to the manager. Uh, that's up to the organization and, and things like that. But uh, these young guys are programmed these days with everything that's going on and how they prepare and all of that and the agent form and front offices. I mean, you know, <clears throat> they get told if you strike a lot of guys out that you're going to get paid a lot of money. It's not about contact, right? So uh, they go to these institutions like Driveline and uh, different ones that help you with velocity, right? So they all think if I throw hard, I'm going to strike people out. And they don't really understand how command and movement and location, all of those things really play into the game with velocity. If you have velocity, that's great. But that's what teams look for. And they look for guys who throw hard. They look for guys who strike out because the analytics tell you if you don't let the put if you don't let the guy hit the ball, he can't get on base. <laughs> you know, unless he walks. So uh, uh, these these are the program things that you just have that human to human contact with the conversations and, and try to get them to understand and buy into the team philosophy and winning. And if you win, good things are going to happen because you're playing well, you're pitching well, or you're hitting well, and, uh, you know, the money will be there at the end. Love it. Now, for yourself, when did you first take up pitching as a youngster? Yeah, so my, mine's a unique story. Uh, it doesn't all work like this. Uh, I grew up in, obviously, as we talked about, New York City. Uh, we had, you know, uh, public parks that we used to go play in and whatnot. So you didn't have, pit, you didn't have really you know, organized baseball uh, besides your community little league that, that I played in. So uh, uh, around the neighborhood, we, we would gather the kids and we would go and play sponge ball. It would just be a spongy ball. We would draw a box on the, on the wall. And, uh, you know, that's where I would pitch and have fun with the guys. So fast age, forward what age was that school. roughly? Oh, that was from the time I could get out of the house, you know, six, seven years old okay. till, uh, until you know when I get when I get to high school, it was just having fun. It was wiffle ball, it was sponge ball, uh, stick ball in the street. It was it was those type of things along with little league. Uh, fast forward, like I said, to uh, to high school. Um, you know, uh, my sophomore year, I was an infielder, third base, second base. Um, you know, going about my business, uh, having fun, and then one day we were getting blown out by uh, a certain team that we were playing. And the coach didn't want to use any other pitchers uh, on that particular day. So he asked me if I would want to pitch the last two innings because we were losing by a lot of runs. And I was like, sure. I mean, I, I don't have experience really doing it in, in high school, but, you know, like, I'll go have fun and do it. Uh, there was a scout there uh, watching another player on the other team. He, uh, he saw the last two innings that I pitched. And then after the game, he walked up to my coach and said, you might want to pitch this guy every five days. And that's how I became a pitcher and continued on to pitching every five days in high school. And then ultimately uh, fortunate enough to be drafted out of high school by the Toronto Blue Jays and, and sign and, and do that and have, a, uh, and have a scholarship to go to LSU. So I had a choice. It was either go to LSU and play baseball in college or it was to uh, sign professionally uh, with the Blue Jays and, and start my career uh, at that point. And how old were you when that scout saw you? Uh, I would have had to be 16 at the time that uh, I pitched at the end of my sophomore year in high school. Okay. And uh, we'll talk about the decision with the Blue Jays a little later on. But I will ask you one thing. You, you talk about the mentality of a pitcher, talking about throwing gas, just trying to strike everybody out versus learning the mechanics and, you know, uh, you know really like becoming a well-rounded pitcher. When did the light bulb go off in your head? Or were you, did you always kind of get it? Or were you always, or were you also a gas guy that, uh, you know, evolved? I don't really know, to be honest with you uh, on that question. I was super naive, you know, I was just playing the game because I felt I was good at it. I loved it. I loved to succeeding. I love to compete. I mean, I think that's something that these guys in, in, in this era, uh, you got to really instill in them is, you know, don't worry about the mechanics. Don't worry about the results. And it's hard not to, but you got to go out and compete. When you're on the mound, compete against the hitter in the box. If you're hitting, compete against the pitcher. Um, so I just, I just love to do it. Um, I was fortunate enough that I, at that age, I was, I was able to throw hard. 
Um, but I also could throw the ball where I wanted to. So That's I good. was, I was given a God given talent to, to be able to throw a baseball, um, you know, like so many, so many other guys are, uh, and no matter what sport, whether it's baseball or throwing football or, you know, playing tennis or anything like that, you know, yeah, you work hard at it, but it's also, uh, a God given thing where you're very fortunate to have that skill. And it's a matter if you're able to hone that skill and, and develop that skill, or, you know, you, you go in a different direction. And, and I was again, fortunate to be able to, to do that, be in a good position and, uh, you know, have good things happen to me. Uh, and we'll talk about the coaching ranks. You know, uh, I noticed a lot of coaches, it was often the ones that didn't have the talent. They didn't have that God given gift. They're the ones who had to grind it out. You know, their stats were not always the best, but, but they stayed through, they persevered, and then they were able to teach their hard work to the next generation. A lot of, a lot of uh, ball players that have the talent, you know, that, you know, it, it was God given. Some of them was easy for them, but they didn't work hard. You know, I think you have a good balance because you worked really hard, clearly, plus you had talent. And so you can't teach talent per se, but you could teach hard work, right? Oh, no doubt about it. I mean, uh, that's something that, you know, shouldn't be, um, you know, Derek Jeter said, you know, somebody may have more talent than you, but they can't outwork you if you don't want them to, you know? So like, that's, that's the big thing is if you put in the work, uh, you know, and as you said, become a grinder, you know, good things will happen. Those are the guys that hang around. Those are the guys that love the game. They compete, uh, you know, and, and, you know, everybody's trying to make it right. That's everybody wants that opportunity to get to the big leagues, you know, uh, to put it in perspective uh, for your listeners. So if you walk into a major league baseball stadium um, and it holds, you know, I think Toronto holds like 60,000, right. Uh, depending, on, depending on what seats they're opening yeah. up, but at least 55. Yeah, but yes. I'm saying if you, would, yeah. if you would fill it to capacity, yeah, it would, it would be about 60,000 yes. people. Yeah. 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 Right. Yep. Yeah. So think about 20,000 people in a 60,000 stadium. Been there many times. I've been in 10,000 with 60,000 stadium. Yes. Okay. So 20,000, right? That's yeah. a third of the stadium. Yep. Yeah. That, that is how many people have played in the big leagues since its inception. Wow. Seriously. <laughs> yes. And, I can tell you, you know, at 10, the stadium is completely empty. It feels like it's just a little clubhouse. 20, it still feels barren. So you're saying, wow. So that kind of stadium is the amount of players that have played. In the major leagues, in still. its lifetime. Wow. That's a cool stat. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. So that's just a little perspective of how hard it is to get to the big leagues. And when guys get to the big leagues, um, you know, how fortunate they are to be in that situation and, and how hard they've worked to get there. I think for any player that's sitting in a clubhouse dejected as far as their role or dejected of where they're at or where their career is, maybe they had a bad game, you know, saying that stat and, and, and uh, really pounding home how lucky you are to be in your position, how many people all over the world would kill to take your spot in one second, that might clue in, you know, but uh, evolving that, knowing then how lucky you were to have played for as long as you did, let's turn to your career uh highlight of your career when you look back now is there one particular game that you you're a part of that's you didn't necessarily play in it but the game that you were actually part of and also what was your greatest pitching moment in the show i'll start with the first the first one of you know i think what my greatest moment was pitching in the show was making it to the big leagues and getting the first start in Oakland, my major league debut. I mean, that's the one that is, is the most special to me that started everything and the ball rolling. Uh, I think the one that I most remember is 9-11 when uh, uh, I gave up the home run to Mike Piazza in what essentially was the first game back in New York City after the Twin Towers uh, were devastated by terrorists. So. That, that would probably be my defining moment in my career of, you know, how people probably would remember me uh, because it, 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 was, it was an incredible moment, maybe not for me at the particular time, <clears throat> but for the city of New York, <clears throat> excuse me, but for the city of New York, and baseball fans all over the world, uh, the uplifting and, and what that game meant to 
uh, a lot of people um, besides myself. I think that would be the one I remember the most as opposed to uh, what I feel like was my most proudest moment was getting to the big leagues and making my first big league start. Especially considering your New York City connection. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you a little secret. So when I was putting together our agenda and our interview, I didn't look back at the interview in 2011. I made my list and I wanted to see how close I was. I was almost bang on. I almost replicated the exact questions from back then because that's what I, what I was still interested in. So what I will tell people that listening we will put in the interview link so people can go back and read our first connection. And it will talk about the New York connection, you growing up. And we'll talk a little bit about today as well. But it's amazing how my mindset 11 years ago was still there. And so, uh, you know, I had to, the way you've evolved in your career, I had to evolve in mine as far as where we're going to head in directions, you know? So uh, interesting though, where you saw yourself as far as the highlight of the, of the career, as far as the biggest game or the most important game you were part of. That being said, when you sit down at night and you think of your career and you picture yourself in a hat and a jersey, so looking through, the, you know, you played some for some great teams. You know, I identify you as an Indian or Yankee. That's, I think, where you had your most prominent roles. I loved you as a closer. That's where I see it at. Some people see Oakland. Some could say Atlanta, Texas. Where, if you had to put, your, if they had the Pitching Hall of Fame, Steve Carsey is going in. They say you're putting in one jersey. Which one are you wearing? It, it would probably have to be the cleveland indians or the cleveland guardians now um yes. just for the fact that i think the most of my success came in those four years as uh, a participant on that team uh it was you know a role that i just i think i embraced after you know injury and the opportunity presented itself um i i think i kind of grew in the role of of that middle man getting to set up man, closing a little bit and, and really understanding what the bullpen was and how to compete, uh, how to get out of jams. Uh, you know, I, I just think that's where my, the biggest, biggest growth spot for me as a player was, and then having the players that I played with uh, helped as well because my knowledge grew, my understanding of the game knew, uh, cause I was hurt years before that. And, I didn't get the experience on the field, but I, I always ask questions and, and I always would talk baseball with people that I was around and, and try to, you know, understand and and get what was going on in the game at that particular time. And I, and I think that's that's where I would end up with that hat and jersey would be the Cleveland Indians. It's uh, it was a great run for four years and we had great teams. And the fact that you did play there and you coached in their system you know, you know, the uh, Cleveland blood is running through, you know, but uh, that being said, you know, and I, when I reflected on uh, always, I, I said to myself, knowing your story, I wish you could have put on that Mets jersey, you know, you did get to put on the Yankees jersey. And, you know, it must have been the greatest thrill ever to be able to be in New York City. Uh, that's why I, I'm also kind of leaning towards the Yankees a bit, even though you don't have as much of the connection as far as over the years and, and through the organization. But uh, if you could have put on that Mets jersey, even for one game, how would that felt? You know, it's, I grew up five minutes from Shea Stadium or what now is, is City Field. Yes. Um, you know, so playing in that stadium for the first time, uh, I've always been an American League guy. I got traded from Cleveland to Atlanta. Atlanta was in New York at Shea Stadium, and that's where I got my first opportunity to, to pitch in that stadium. And, and it was special. You know, you go back and, you know, you, you pitch in a place where you went and you seen – hundreds of games uh, as, a, as a young boy and as a kid. And in high school, I got to watch, you know, Keith Hernandez, Doc Good and Lenny Dykstra, uh, Gary Carter, uh, Ron Darling, you know, David Cohn. I got to watch all those guys, that, especially, you know, in my high school years uh, from 86 to 90. And uh, fortunate, I was fortunate enough to play with a lot of those players, believe it or not. So we did. Uh, wow. 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 Yeah. Wow. You know, yeah. I played with Doc Good and I played with Ron Darling. Yes. Um, you know, and, and there's probably a few more that was on that team that, that I ended up, you know, uh, playing with Kevin Elster, probably a little bit. So, um, you know, uh, it, it was special. I don't know about putting on the Jersey. It's a, it's a tough Jersey to put on, <laughs> but it would, it would have been nice. I mean, I never thought about playing in New York, to be quite honest with you. Really? Uh, yeah. Uh, it, the, the Yankee thing just, just transpired and, and it just happened when I was a free agent. Uh, you know, I had choices in front of me and I, I felt 
the choice in front of me is where I wanted to try to go and, and win because they had so many great players. And uh, I think the ultimate thing for every player is to win a World Series, whether you do or not. I think that's always the carrot that you chase, uh, right. you know, and you, you want to be part of something special like that to, you know, whether it's the Stanley cup and you get to skate around the rink with the, the Stanley cup above your head, uh, you know, football holding the Lombardi trophy or baseball holding the world series trophy. Um, you know, uh, I was never able to experience that. I've been in the playoffs many a times. And again, there's not a lot of players that do get experienced that. So when you get the opportunity to, to, to try to achieve that, uh, that was the, that was the sole decision when I made it um, uh, when I made it with the Yankees and became a free agent is because the Yankees had won the World Series in 96 and then 98, 99, 2000, lost the Diamondbacks in 2001. And I'm like, OK, they've been to the World Series, uh, you know, five out of the last six years, won it four times. They got Mariano Rivera as their closer. I can kind of get inserted as a setup man. They have all these great players like Derek Jeter, Bernie Williams. You know, Jason Giambi signed there at the time. Uh, Alfonso Soriano. I mean, I could go on and loaded. on. Loaded. They're loaded. You know, yeah, they're loaded. And, and I'm like, here's an opportunity yeah. to do what every boy wants to do. And, mm -hmm. and you know, I'm going to take my shot. Unfortunately, it didn't happen that way. But, you know, you put yourself in the best position that you possibly can. And, and you kind of just uh, work for the best. I can say having been to watch both teams in their home stadium. So I, I've been to Shea Stadium. I didn't, I didn't go to City Field. I could say riding the subway, going to the, to the stadium, you felt a great electricity, you know? It was, uh, and I've been to many different cities uh, during the MLB Report days and just as a fan, uh, I always wanted to check out different, you know, I love Pittsburgh. I love uh, their stadium, how they're set up, you know, it's, uh, but every city has a different vibe, you know, like Chicago is a very harsh city when you're sitting in there watching the White Sox. Yeah. But uh, the Mets, you know, there's excitement, the buzz. When when you're going to the Yankees in a regular season game, it feels like a World Series. Like, I remember what the World Series years were like in Toronto and going to a World Series game in Toronto. That was the same electricity for a regular season game at Yankee Stadium. Did you feel the same thing as a player? Yeah, absolutely. The, the passion of the New York fans is incredible. Yeah. They know the game. They love the game. Uh, you know, back in the day with the Yankees, when they were so good, it was hard to get tickets, right? So when they right. go to the games, they want to enjoy themselves and they want to have the opportunity to, to go there and root on their team. So, uh, and, and there's a few other places around the league where I think that that passion exudes uh, with the fans. Uh, it's not only in New York, but they really understand the game. You know, when there's a big situation, they're all on their feet. They're all clap, clapping and, and you feel that electricity and that excitement uh, that, that helps, that drives you because you want to do well for, for the fans. I mean, not only for yourself, but you want to do well for the fans. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just, uh, it's, a, it's a great place uh, and, and it's a great fan base to, to be a part of. When you hear Sinatra playing New York, New York at the end of the game, it is the best feeling ever. And I got to ask. You know, you know why that is, right? Yeah. Why, why is that? When, <laughs> when, when, when you win. When you win. Yes. So they play a different version when you lose. Oh, I didn't know that they actually played a different version of it. Oh. Yeah. So when you win and you know you're walking off the field and you hear that, uh, then uh, you know you won the game. That I, and, uh, and Enter Sandman. When you yes. hear Enter Sandman back in the day, you knew Mariano you had to comes on. That yes. That was amazing. In, in Toronto, they played it for him at least once in a sign of respect. I think it was last year. That was freaking cool. And the stadium, like, erupted. Yeah, yeah. Stupidest mistake I ever made was going to watch a Yan Yankees Red Sox game. I did not wear a Red Sox uh, shirt, but I did wear a red T-shirt sitting in the outfield. And everybody was convinced I was a Red Sox fan. And they booed me every time a Red Sox player did anything. And when a Red Sox player got a home run in the third inning, I stood up on my bench and I started kissing my pipes. And I didn't care at this point, and they all fed into it. And then the second a Yankees player got a home run the next inning, everybody stood up and started kissing their pipes. And it's only New York. That's only New it, York. It's uh, you got to have thick skin, right? Yeah, so yeah. when you grow up in New York and, and you get out to the real world, uh, it, it prepares you for some, some things that you, you would come across. So walk us through then the next topic being the grind of a pitcher, the mental physical side of it it's i think one of the most challenging positions sports you know to play 
And as far as the whole stadium is watching you, they're watching you on every single pitch. You got to prepare physically. You got to prepare mentally. You know, how did you find it? Because so many pitchers have broken so early on in their careers from the mental side or the physical side. You know, how did you find it? How did you do it? Well, preparation is the key, right? The, the, the better you're prepared, um, I think, you know, the more success you're going to have as a player in general, not only as a pitcher. Uh, but to your question with the, with how did I do it? Listen, you learn how to do it. Uh, it's not easy as a young player coming into the league to understand what 162 game season entails, uh, the travel, um, you know, the changing of the time zone, being able to perform if you're a starter every fifth day, being able to perform if you're a reliever uh, on, on a daily basis, if you have to pitch two out of three or three out of four. Um, so I, I would say you grow with, with that position, you learn, you talk to other players who have gone through that. And, and I've always said, you don't know how to do it until you do it. <laughs> so for a young player who comes up and is like, I got this, I understand, uh, you know, you try to help that player as a coach uh, understand like, each day has its own meaning. Um, you know, your throwing program every day isn't exactly the same. Some days you're more taxed than others. Some days you're a little bit more fresher than others. But the main thing is, is you're not getting anybody out in your throwing program. You're getting people out when seven o'clock bell rings and the game starts. And if your number is called or your name is called when that bullpen phone rings as a reliever, that's when you got to get people out. So how do you prepare for that during the day? Rest and recovery, eating well, uh, getting your workouts in, and then learning how on a day-to-day -day basis uh, to come to the field and prepare for that particular day. Um, if, as a, again, as a pitcher, whether you're a starter and pitching that fifth, every fifth day or as a reliever to prepare that. And, you know, I, I think you just learn as you go along, the more experience you have in the league, the more years you played, you understand your routine will deviate a little bit, but you set yourself up with a good routine on a daily basis. And uh, I think that gives you the best opportunity to be successful in the long run. You're coming up in the Oakland ranks. You know, you, you start, came up as a starter originally, you know, uh, looking back on it, you had your coaches, obviously, did you have mentors? Did you have pitchers that looked after you, veterans on that Oakland staff back then? Absolutely. I was 21 years old when I got, uh, you know, called to the big leagues. I, you know, it was a whirlwind. I, I was traded two weeks before that yes. uh, for Ricky Henderson in 1993 when the Blue Jays won the World Series. So I got traded. I spent, I made two starts in the minor leagues with Oakland. And then all of a sudden, uh, August 17th, I'm making my debut. 17 days later after I get traded, I'm standing on a big league mound against a big league team, you know, ready to perform and start my big league career. Um, so that, uh, to, you know, just to be able to do that is, is, is a whirlwind. So to understand, you know, how to prepare and how to do that, uh, I had a little bit of help once I got there. But a lot of guys kind of just were like, whoa, we don't want to talk to this kid too early, you know, and, and give him, you know, any more nerves or anything because they don't know me. Right. They don't know anything about me. So Bob Welch was a one. Bobby Witt was another one. Um, right. Dennis he was Eckersley. from Texas. He, yeah. 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 Dennis Eckersley was another one that I was able to talk with the remainder of 93 as a starter because as a starter I was pitching once every five days mm -hmm. and I got to sit on the bench with the guys who weren't starting um and I, I would I would just pick their brain and you know I guess for some reason you know that they really liked that and and they took me in wholeheartedly I mean uh you know even the even the position players and and I got to learn from them a lot as well so uh, yes, there was a group of guys who corralled me and took me underneath their wing and, and started that process of trying to teach me what, a, what the big leagues was like, because these guys had many years in the big leagues. So they went through the, 
you know, hardships that I went through uh, when I was 21. Uh, Bob Welch was in the big leagues when he was 21. Bobby Witt was in the big leagues when he was uh, a young kid. So, um, again, these guys, I was fortunate enough as a player that I was around, around tremendous people who cared about me, wanted me to teach me the right way, uh, and, and play the game the right way and also compete the right way. No, I think that Cat Cordero in my mind was the first guy from college that actually was gro a groomed reliever. You know, the way they say, you know, what do you call a country music star, a failed rock star? What do you call a reliever, a failed starter? You know, that was the, the cliche back in the day. But, uh, you know, look at look at Eckers. Eck was a great example of a guy. A lot of people don't even realize that he was a starter. You know, he did. He was a great starter and he pitched a lot of damn innings and he became the great reliever. So I'm sure he was a great source of information for you. Oh, he was. Uh, you know, it was, uh, you know, I got to lock her next to him. So it was really, really cool. Uh, I, I really looked up to him as, as a mentor. Uh, you know, I obviously followed him and, and I knew a lot about his career. Um, you know, I wasn't relieving at that time, but the knowledge of the game was incredible from him. Uh, you know, I kind of just kind of flocked a little bit more towards the starters, even though, you know, Eck was, was right next to me uh, because I wanted to know what they did every five days. I wanted to know what they did between game, uh, between starts. I wanted to know how they prepared. I wanted to know how much film did they watch? I wanted to know, all of those things, and then uh, kind of take bits and pieces from each people that I've heard things from and incorporate that into my routine and how that fit me and how that would work for me and how that would make me successful. It's amazing the, the degrees of separation because we had a, you and I had a phone conversation about a month ago, and I brought up the name Bobby Witt because we're talking about your son, and he's 11 years old, correct? Yes. You sent me the video footage of him. His, his hitting stroke is unbelievable. Like he's as good as any player I've ever seen on the majors as far as just the sweet swing that he's got, but he's also got an arm and he throws, you know, and now with the universal DH, the days of hitting and pitching are over. We took a look at your stats, my friend. You did get some uh, major league at bats. It did happen for you, right? Uh, Four of them. Four of them, correct. Uh, you scored that one run in 97 with Oakland. Two so strike that was not in that bat, just so you know. Yes. It was not in the bats. Okay, let's make that clear. Yeah. I pinch ran for Jason Giambi in 1997. <laughs> That's how I scored that run. Was he grabbing a beer at the time? No, just joking. But, uh... <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? But, no, but you weren't. You, so you weren't hit by pitch. You weren't walked. You just pinch ran, and you, you scored that run. How did it feel crossing the plate scoring that run? It was, you know, as a pitcher, you don't really get to do that unless you're in the National League, right? So I was, again, in the American League, yes. uh, you know, had the opportunity to, you know, get put in the game to pinch run. At that time, I was much younger, much faster, uh, you know, had an understand. They saw me in spring training mess around on the bases. So uh, we were running out of players and, and Art Howe was like, go run. So I went and, I went and ran. Uh, Jesse Orozco was pitching. Um, he ended up trying to pick me off a couple times and believe it or not, balked me to second base. And, th and then uh, I believe it was Matt Stairs got a base hit to right field and I was able to, you know, round third and, and score the winning run. And, uh, you know, it was, uh, it was an and it was, amazing and it, was, and it was the winning run. And it was the winning run. It was the ninth inning. So, Love it. Uh, yeah. So, you know, to be able to be in that position again, when you don't do it, it's just like anything. Yeah. When you don't get to do something and, and, and you're, you get the opportunity to do it, you always have more fun and it's always an experience. And, uh, you know, I took it for what it's worth. I always tried to, you know, uh, bargain for more pinch running opportunities. Yes. Uh, you know, sometimes it happened, sometimes it didn't, but that, that was uh, pretty special since I didn't get on base uh, myself when I hit. <laughs> well, Xavier Scruggs was on a few episodes back and he's another MLB reports alumni. He's on the MLB network. Great, great guy. And we debated a few topics, including can pitchers hit? What do we think of, uh, the universal DH, uh, as a pitcher, like considering you were, you, you were growing up as a teenager, as a hitter pitching found you, you know, uh, you look at, you know, when you, in your, when you're in the coaching ranks, you had your young players and, 
you know, from a pitching standpoint, do you think it's better for the game that they're not going to go up to bat? Do you think uh, from the game itself, from purity standpoint, it would better still keep the National League game? How do you look at it? Um, again, it's it's growth, right? It's it's something that uh, you know, rule changes come about, and Major League Baseball has to has to find a, a, a fair balance between both sides. I actually like the DH rule. I, I think it's mm-hmm. going to benefit the game. It's going to score more runs. Um, you know, I think it's great for pitchers to, to know the game and to understand how to hit and bunt. Uh, but most pitchers, they don't get enough at bats. They don't get enough batting practice because you don't want when when you make your money pitching, you don't want to get hurt hitting right. because ultimately your job is to go and pitch. So for these guys not to hit anymore, um, you know, it, it's unfortunate, but again, I, I think it's the, the right decision. It's going to generate more runs. It's going to generate, uh, you know, some more playing time for some players who might not be in the game anymore where they can just get up there and DH like a Nelson Cruz, um, you know, and, and is, is, is a defensive liability to be quite honest, but can still hit the ball and uh, is, is just tremendous hitter and, and can help a team win and get where do they want to go. So, uh, I think that rule change is is fantastic. Uh, you know, the game, you have to grow with it. And I, I understand, you know, all the people out there who don't want to take away the, the pitcher hitting because it's the, the National League game. And it's 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 hard to, to see that. But, uh, you know, generationally, things change and, and you have to adapt to it. it uh, it's amazing. I grew up in an American League city in Toronto, as we talked about, and uh, I grew up with the DH. But I loved the NL game. I loved, you know, the double switches. I loved, you know, the uh, the planning behind the game. You know, there's a lot of managerial moves. But I also understand, you know, Xavier said the same thing. You know, pitchers aren't putting the time in the cages. You know, we're giving away at bats. People are getting injured. They're too valuable. And, you know, having people, you know, uh, keeping uh, players on that can be dedicated DHs. And that's a whole other discussion, you know, dedicated yeah. DHs versus not having a dedicated DH and just giving people rest days and, and cycling through. But, you know, I've seen enough times where I have like, I, I, I'm sitting in Toronto and we're watching like the uh, backup second baseman with a 250 average and he's thrown in as a DH. And I'm like, what's the point of this? Might as well put the pitcher in, you know, but for the, but for the most part, you tend to have either a dedicated DH or one of your superstars are getting a rest day, so to speak, by getting up there. But I guess from the pitching standpoint, it's one less grind to worry about, uh, you know, on top of everything else, you know, having to chart the, uh, the players, you know, having to, uh, if you're a starter, you know, reliever going in there, you said two or three days. And uh, on top of that, having to worry about hitting, you know, and running the bases and everything else that goes along with it. So maybe for the so, pitchers, it makes it easier. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I'll add one or two extra points. Please, I think please. for the, for the, for the baseball purist, I think the strategic portion of the game gets taken away for the manager where he has to make a decision in the fifth inning if the bases are loaded and the pitcher's coming up. And I will say for the health of the players, relievers, I think it's a good thing too, because now you're in that situation where the hitters, hit, the pitcher's hitting third in the sixth inning and you have to get a reliever up to start warming up. And then the manager makes the decision. The reliever's already warm and the manager makes a decision to call down and say, Hey, sit that guy down. I'm going to let him hit because nobody got on base. Now, you just warmed up a pitcher physically and now you're sending your starter back out there. So that reliever has to sit down and it's taxing on him for the day where that doesn't happen. The American league. That start stop. Like uh, that's a really good point because I know I've been, I, you know, watching like uh, su- a Sunday afternoon baseball and a guy could be up, up and down, you know, three, four times and he's got to be really hot and got to go cool down. And that, that can't be very easy on the arm either. Right. Oh, it's taxing. There's yeah. no, there's, you know, yeah. the, the teams track how many times guys get up and how many guys get down, how many pitches they throw in the bullpen. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're real cognizant on how many pitches they throw, you know, in the game and uh, you know, what that workload is like. So they can try to keep as many of their players healthy as possible. So this is talking from a player perspective, but you know, you, you've experienced both ends that you, I see your hats on, right? Yeah. Sport team. Hat. Love it. Uh, what, what, what hoodie are we wearing? Uh, Carolina. Okay, so, so we're UNC the- plays at nine o'clock this morning. It's a team that I kind of watch a little bit and uh, enjoy them, and and they're a fun college team to uh, to root for. Love it. 
but people now, you know, in, in today's game that know Steve Carsey, they know him as the pitching coach, you know, the bullpen coach. So you came up in the Indians Guardians uh, um, farm system as a coach. And I always envision you ending up in Cleveland and uh, as bullpen coach, graduating to pitching coach, maybe manager one day. Uh, and that didn't happen. You ended up going to Milwaukee of all places. Uh, walk us through that process as far as how did you end up from one organization to the other, having been so ingrained in Cleveland? Yeah. So at the, at the end of my career in 2000, end of 2006, 2007, uh, you know, I made that transformation of semi-retiring. Uh, I had surgery on my shoulder uh, at the end of that season uh, just to, to get healthy. I took a few years off made some phone calls because, uh, you know, I felt like, you know, at 36, I was at home and, you know, I, I needed more in my life at that particular time. So, uh, you know, started making some calls and, you know, I was fortunate enough. Uh, he's in the organization now. Uh, Mark Shapiro and Ross Atkins were with the, the uh, Guardians or the Indians at the time. We just call them and, Indians for our purposes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then I got hired. Um, uh, by the Indians, and then started my career at the lowest level. I wanted to learn how it worked from the ground up, just like I've always done, whether it was a player or growing up in life. You, you, it's hard to, it never really works if you start at the top and work down. So you got to work down and get to the top. So I learned the basics of it each year. I got better and better at, uh, at the craft of coaching and gained experience, gained, learned, the, learned the little things about coaching that you need to be a good coach. And that is learning how to communicate, learning how that each guy is his own individual and he has his own little quirks or his own little things. You might be able to say one thing to one guy, but you have to say another thing to another guy. There's certain guys that are more sensitive. There's certain guys you can get on and give them a kick in the butt, you know, more often than the, than the other guy where the other guy, you won't get the best out of them if, 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 you, if you handle them in that aspect. Uh, almost like kids, you know, so it's like it's, running it's, a law firm, my friend, it's no different. As soon as you have yeah. an organization, you could be running uh, Facebook and guess what? You have what? 10,000 employees. Same idea. Yeah. They're not all the same. So, no. you know, I, again, I uh, got there, went through there for three or four years and then got the triple A job, yes. spent three years, spent three years in Columbus, uh, with, with that team. And then, uh, you know, off season, I'm sitting at home, uh, a player development coach, uh, who runs the player development, uh, for the Indians calls me and says, Hey, uh, the Brewers called, they want you to take an interview for, for their bullpen coach job. Do you want to take the interview? Uh, I was granted the interview, went up to Milwaukee, uh, sat in front of, uh, you know, the, the crew up there, whether it be David Stearns, Matt Arnold, and, and those guys went through the interview process, uh, Craig Council, obviously. Uh, and then, um, you know, went home the next day. By the time I walked off the plane, Craig Council called me and asked me if I wanted the job. Uh, so, so yeah. Mm -hmm. So the interview must have went well. I took the job, spent three years in Milwaukee as their bullpen coach nice. and had an unbelievable time with the players and uh, the guys I had in the bullpen and developing those relationships, which I still have today. And then this past off season uh, with my son turning 11 and being in, in baseball for such a long time and coaching for 10 years of his 11 years of his life. Uh, you know, I just decided to step down and, and, and do what was best for my family and kids. The hardest decision probably that I've ever had to make in my life, but I know it's the right decision because it's for my family and it's for my son. And I want to watch him. He needs his dad. And, uh, and I, you know, I want to watch him grow up in, in his 11 to 16 or 17 years. And if an opportunity in baseball comes where I'm able to do work from home or travel a short bit, then, uh, then that, if that comes to fruition, then, then maybe the opportunity presents itself for me to do that. Uh, and, and, and we'll see what happens. Um, but, uh, it's, it's been a great run and, and i love baseball. I love what I do. And those, those relationships are, are amazing that I've developed uh, over the last, not only three years in Milwaukee, but the last 10 years of the guys I've coached and I still keep in contact with them. And it's, and it's a lot of fun. I had chills going to my spine as you're saying that, because 
you, th- you remember our timeline, you know, we first spoke as you were getting into coaching that just so happened that that's when we connected. And when I, and a true, true story, when I reached out to you and we spoke on the phone, I had looked up the Brewers uh, roster. I saw you're there, you're coaching, everything's good. And you dropped the ball on me, by the way, I, I left. And I said, what do you mean you left? And it, the, it, I couldn't have picked a, a better time or worse time in that sense. But I'm like, wow, the journey. And here we are. We started at your coaching start. And now we're here as, as you stepped away for the moment. It was, uh, it, it's, it's funny how life works out that way. And um, I'm thinking, you know, again, I, I, I've always loved the Brewers. And um, I, 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 again, I saw you being in Cleveland. When you got that interview, do you know who put your name forward? Who was the one, who, who was the one who suggested you should be? Was it Craig? That's a great question. I do not know who put my name forward. Uh, you know, baseball is a tight, tight knit community, right? Mm-hmm. So there's always people talking within, you know, the ranks. They always call each other for trades. And, and most of these guys, not all, but most of these guys are friends, not yes. only on the field, but off the field. So, um, you know, uh, I've always felt like I've handled myself the, the right way. I've gone about my business the right way. And, you know, if you do that and, and you're good at your job, opportunities will present itself. And again, I was just fortunate enough to be, uh, you know, put in that position and have the opportunity to, to get that job. And uh, I'm so fortunate I did. It was it was. When we made the playoffs three years in a row. So, you know, not only was we were we successful in the bullpen and on the field, but developing, like I said, those relationships with uh you know, a Devin Williams, a Josh Hader, a box, Peter, Brad Boxberger, you know, all the guys who come through. Uh, and I know I'm missing a lot of names, but uh, there are a lot of guys that are super special to me. And, uh, you know, all of them just were super ecstatic for me when I stepped away because they know Kingston so well over the last three years and they seen him grow up for three years. And, uh, you know, they just, uh, you know, as hard as it was for me to step away for them, they understand, they understood why. That's one of the things that, you know, when you and I talked on the phone, we said, uh, I told you, in my opinion, you know, life's good, life's bad. One of the great things about baseball, except when it's locked out on strike and it ain't anymore, baseball is always there for you. You know, you're, you're spending that time with your son as a father. I'm a father. You know, I can relate to that. And putting that time in now, you're never going to get those years back. But when you'll be ready, you know, baseball will be there. You know, that's and, and just you'll have to see where you're envisioning it. Uh, finishing off of Milwaukee, what's Bernie Brewer really like? Yeah, I don't get to see him very often, but no, I yeah. really like watching him slide down the slide when we hit a home run. I mean, that was a lot of fun, but, uh, you know, he's a good guy. I mean, he's, he doesn't do much besides yeah. slide down the slide and, and, and do a couple of uh, rounds in the stadium. But uh, the, the guy who's in Billy Brewer, really good. I, I got to meet the guy who plays ace in Toronto, you know, and he's a real like athletic guy, you know, he does the splits and all that kind of stuff. I, I give those guys a lot of credit walking around in that costume all game long, doing what they're doing. Hats off to them. You can't pay me enough money to do that. Yeah. The one, the one interesting figure, I call him interesting because mm-hmm. you never know what's going to come out of his mouth was yes. uh, the interaction with Bob Uecker just about on a daily basis. Cause he's always around them. He does the radio and he's always around the clubhouse. And you know, this guy is a, is a special guy when you, uh, are able to talk to him and, and hear his stories. You want a good Bob Euchre story? Sure. Okay, so I met Bob Euchre. Um, I and I'm going to be talking about this in another episode where how do you get autographs of your favorite celebrities? So I was a big, big autograph geek back in the day, and Dave Parker was one of my favorite players, and he was uh, on Milwaukee at the time. And so I was camping out day and night at the hotel. I got to meet Dave Parker. I want the Cobra's autograph. So uh, as I'm waiting by the team bus. Uh, he, no Dave Parker, but Bob Euchre comes sprinting down and goes into the team bus. Bob Euchre gives me the finger and, uh, I'm like a kid. I'm like 15 or something. I'm like, why is Bob Euchre doing this anyways? And he seems really angry. So I kind of just, I don't know what I did. I honestly didn't even see him. I just stood there. Right. So I come back to the hotel that night. Uh, Cobra got two home runs for the Brewers against the Jays. I'm all ramped up and I get a tap on the shoulder and I look over and it's Bob Euchre. And I'm like, Mr. Euchre, how are you? And he says, hey, kid, listen, uh, I'm really sorry about that. 
uh, these kids were pestering me in the lobby the whole afternoon. I, it was for them behind you, not, not, not yourself. So I'm really sorry about that. Would you like an autograph or something? I got the one baseball, but I'm saving it for Dave Parker, right? So I can't get Bob Euchre to autograph it. Uh, so I look at him, I said, Mr. Euchre, um, I don't need an autograph. What I would like to do is shake your hand and tell you, I really loved you in Mr. Belvedere. I thought you were a great actor. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he gives me this crooked look like he thinks I'm actually lying to him. But I love Mr. Belvedere. It was amazing. But uh, little known fact, Bob Euchre was a, a TV show uh, he, uh, he at the time where he had an English butler and he had his family. And uh, anyways, he was Mr. Belvedere and he was in obviously major league. But uh, you got to meet Bob Euchre and spend some time with him. He's I can only imagine the stories he's got. Oh, uh, we don't have enough time to listen to all his stories uh with with all of the guys but uh yeah he's a he's a special guy and uh very fortunate again to get the opportunity to you know know him and and get to know him a little bit more than just from the outside well reflecting back now steve i know i know you're really busy and uh you know thank you again for making the time we got a few minutes and i know you got to head off because your son has his tournament uh looking back in your career now uh, you know, I, I could have a novel as far as uh, chapters of things that I want to cover off with you today. It's just a glimpse of, of you and as far as, you know, your story. But when you look back on it, if Toronto had not traded you and you had gone and pitched for the Blue Jays, how do you see your life would have been different? Oh, uh, I, I guess we all would love to know that answer, right? If we would yes. go back in time and, and take a different path on how things would, uh, how things would come to fruition. But, uh, did you ever daydream I that? I mean, if yeah. I, if, if I got the opportunity in 93 and didn't get drafted, I would have won a world series, right? Yeah. That would be one thing that would be, uh, different is 93. They ended up going to win the world series. I could have been part of that. Uh, I could have been part of, you know, the rotation with, uh, you know, Stottlemyre and Pat Hankin and David Wells and all of those guys moving forward. Um, but, at the end of the day, uh, you know, I try to look forward and I try not to look back and try to recreate something that may or may not have happened. I'm extremely blessed in what has transpired from the time, you know, I was a young kid, but from the time I got into the big leagues uh, until, uh, until this point, whether it be playing, whether it be coaching, the relationships that I've developed, the people that I've known, uh, the people that I've grown up with, the friends that I still have today. I mean, uh, you know, I'm, I'm blessed. Um, I'm fortunate. And I'm just glad that I have what I have and the group of people around me who support me on a daily basis. Um, and, you know, friends like you, um, you know, friends like friends like I have in Arizona uh, who, who are there for me uh, no matter what, whether I was the baseball player or whether I'm just a friend in their life. And uh, I think at the end of the day, if we all can just reflect and have an understanding of where we've been, our journey to where we are at now and where we want to go, uh, you know, I, I think that's a beautiful thing. Love that. Listen, man, one day, you know, I could see us being in a home one day together, you know, we're in our nineties and, you know, we're putting our teeth in the, in the, in the, into the glass. You're always going to be that kid on that score rookie card for me. And I'm always going to see he's the guy trainer for Ricky. And you know what? That's pretty freaking cool where that's not a footnote. And that's the life, you know, you got, you still got to have your career, a great career, got many great experiences, but it's, it's amazing the journey, you know, and that being said, you know, that's one of the things I, I told you when we were talking and emailing and texting is one of the, I, I feel that the journey is, is it's, it's, it's still going, you know, that's why the story is not done because there's the playing part of it. There's the coaching part of it. There's the parenting part of it. And, you know, you're, you're living the life you want, you know, at the end of the day, nobody's forcing you to do what you, you know, you get to choose that you chose when it was time to leave the game, you chose when it was time to get back into the game. You know, you could have gone, sat in Arizona, you know, uh, sipped on the, some margaritas and enjoyed the sun. But no, you went and you coached in the minors. You made it on to Milwaukee. And, you know, at the point where you could have easily gone and eventually get a pitching uh, coach role in the majors, you know, maybe a managerial role someday. 
And you're saying at this point, this is where I got to be. I went back and watched a clip of you. Uh, they brought you on MLB.com during one of the uh, Cleveland games and you were in the booth and uh, talked oh, about yeah. it for 12 minutes. Again, it's not easy to find you, man. You're hiding off the internet, but I'm finding you, you know? So <laughs> when you're going to type in Steve Carsey interview now, this is going to be the top freaking thing for the next 50 years. But that being said, I'm, no, you, you were great. The way you're talking now and speaking, you know, engaging the audience, when you think now to the future, you know, because you know the game's going to come itching again, right? It's only a matter oh, of course. It, I, it always happens. And the calls are still coming. You said that people are feeling it out. If, if you had to close your eyes and envision it, you know, at this point, where do you see? Do you think it'll be coaching again? Do you think it'll be broadcasting, you know, uh, front office? Where, where, what's Steve Carsey's future in baseball? At this God, point? I wish I knew that answer. It would, life would be a lot easier moving forward on what I wanted to do if I, if I knew that. You know, I'm just going to take it day by day, to be quite honest with you. Uh, I'm going to leave the door open uh, for, for anything, you know, uh, that, that comes my way and, and consider it. Uh, I, I just know at this particular time, it needs to be from home. In a few years or six or seven years from now, I don't know. Um, you know, maybe I'm fortunate enough to get something at home with the Diamondbacks, right? Like that would be a fantastic gig because now I have the best of both worlds. Uh, you know, so day by day, you know, hour by hour, minute by minute, uh, kind of just plug along here. I mean, broadcasting would be a beautiful thing. Uh, you know, God knows I, I love to talk at times, um, even though I like to, to be in the shadows, uh, but I love the game. I have a passion for the game and, uh, you know, I, I love where the game is going. Uh, I think they're, they've had their bumps in the road. I mean, it's, it's a business like anything else and, and they have to negotiate a contract and do that. And it's, it's really hard. You know, you got low, low end budget teams to high end budget teams and they all don't want the same thing. Uh, so the commissioner has a really tough job. I, I understand that, and, you know, one, I'm glad that the game's back. Uh, I'm going to be able to watch some major league baseball on TV with my son. I'm going to be able to, you know, watch the guys that have, been a part of the life for the last three years and 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 the best thing about it is I get to text them now and they'll get it after the game as I'm watching it and they'll be able to text me back you know I always told them I said listen I might be stepping down but I'm not stepping away I mean if you guys ever need anything from me I'm only a phone call away I'll be here for you and uh you know, if there's any questions that they needed to be answered, I would I would do that, too, because I really feel like the group of guys that I had in that bullpen, they're like my. 11, 12, 13 other children that I had to, you know, nurture and grow up with uh, while I was on the job. I love that. I love that. You know, that's a great image. And I, I can't tell you how many times I've watched interviews with athletes, especially football players, that they step away. And they're saying, I have no interest in this game whatsoever. I'm done. I'm done. I'm not watching any games. I'm not talking to anybody. I'm moving on to my next chapter. The love of the game is so evident within you. And that was evident with you when we first spoke. And I, I can only see that growing over time. And, and whatever you're going to choose, I know you're going to be amazing at it, man. I know you have that passion. I know the Diamondbacks are watching this right now. And they're thinking, we got to put some offers here. We need this guy before somebody else grabs him. So good luck to Dimex for doing that. Uh -huh. I'm just, I'm rather than starting doing the cliche uh what are your predictions and who's going to win this year i'm going to ask you one final question okay steve today steve carsey today stepping away from the brewers now and uh going to uh, focus on family life if he can go now and have a conversation sit in the room for an hour with steve carsey the rookie the one that gets drafted the one that got traded to oakland he's about to go pitch for oakland he's going to start his major career if you could speak to your younger self what would you tell yourself? Looking back on it, if I was sitting across from the younger Steve Carsey, uh, I would say enjoy the ride. Work hard and have your ears open. That would be the basis of the conversation is always look to learn, always be humble, and enjoy what you're doing on a daily basis because it doesn't last forever. And the times that you have with your friends, with the game, uh, the relationship you develop 
within all of that will be precious down the line. It, you probably remember your first game like it was yesterday and it goes no by, doubt about it. It goes by in a heartbeat, doesn't it? I couldn't tell you how 16 years went by of my life when I was playing. Yes. From the minor leagues from 1990, I got drafted to 2000, end of 2006. Those 16 years are a blur. I mean, there are things that you remember within those years, but for that time period to go so fast, you just, you just wonder like, where did that time go? And uh, you know, that's why you need to enjoy it because it doesn't last forever, whether you're playing or coaching, um, you know, everything, everything good comes to an end at some point. And, uh, you know, just put everything you have into it while you're doing it. The listeners out there that have watched different episodes and, uh, of the chosen life, they'll see a constant theme The people come on, they found their chosen life. There's never laziness. They grind, they work hard. And they enjoy the ride because you, you, you don't know and you never know when the next journey is going to hit. So hearing your story, Steve, I, I know that will inspire young players out there that want to grind out to the majors, professionals in their respective careers, you know, it, it, kids in school, coming up the ranks in high school, university. Anybody could take your work ethic, your passion, your positivity and transfer it to their walk of life. So thank you. Yes. Control what you can control. And if it's out of your control, get it out of your head. That's right. Steve, this was an ultra pleasure. Sorry to keep you a little late, but this has been a true treat. Honestly, I could have been kept going for the next five hours with questions, but we certainly hope we'll have you back on The Chosen Life. I'd love to do it again. It's a great hour, and I would love to talk more about whether it be baseball or life in general. I'd love to do it with you. Awesome. So let's do that and not wait 11 years. We'll book it up soon. I know you're really busy with the family life and everything. So honestly, uh, it's been a true pleasure and honor, honestly, as a friend, a, uh, um, I feel like family now. And as a wise man once said, just call my name and I'll be there. So anytime- absolutely. Jonathan, thank you. I really appreciate the time. And thank you. And uh, the audience thanks you as well. And uh, it's been a real pleasure to have you on The Chosen Life. And as we sum up, we pull out the pipes. Let's see it. And- Keep living the chosen life. Keep living the chosen life, baby. Thanks, brother. Yes. Cheers. Wait a minute. Are we still running? Well, I know you already hit the subscribe button, the like button to say how much you love this episode and the notification bell so you get notified of all our future episodes. But you still feel like you want more. Well, when you're ready to contact the chosen lawyers at Corman's LLP, we are here to help you. Whether you're looking to close a real estate transaction, a refinance, a corporate commercial matter, like a lease, a shareholder agreement, an incorporation, you need a will or power of attorney prepared, a family law matter comes up, contact the chosen lawyers. We are here for you. So how do you get in touch with us? It's really simple. You go onto our website, Go to cormans.ca, that's K-O-R-M-A-N-S dot C-A, fill out the contact form, and a chosen lawyer will get in touch with you. So it's very easy. We look forward to seeing you very soon. And thank you very much for watching The Chosen Life. We'll see you back very shortly.